And let me just tell you a few of the things I want to do as your next governor. And it's going to be a battle between now and November to make that happen. The first thing we need to do is get North Carolina into the energy business. We've wasted at least four to five years sitting on the sidelines while other states look for gas exploration and oil exploration. While Pennsylvania, New York, Ohio, the Dakotas, and even Virginia is looking on how we can do exploration both offshore and inland to create jobs but to also participate in the energy independence of our country. And you in Asheville know more than ever, when there's a gas crisis, you get hit first with high gas prices and long lines. I've been in your lines. I've seen the gas prices up there. When the lines disturb coming up from Louisiana, you get hit first. We ought to participate in the energy independence of our country right here in North Carolina and create jobs. And right now, our current governor and, yes, lieutenant governor have sat on the sidelines on the issues, formed committees, formed commissions. It's time for action. Action which allows both exploration, but also action at the same time in which you have good environmental and regulation and ensure we know how the money is going to be spent and we do it safely and wisely. We could have been doing this for the past four to six years, but we didn't. As your next governor, I'm going to work with Nikki Haley, our competition, and Governor McDonald in Virginia, and Bill Haslam in Tennessee, and go, how can we form a sort southeast coalition and convince Washington to also get off their rear ends and get us into the energy business? This is extremely important. It takes action. The second thing that I think is very important, and I'm hearing especially from small businesses, is regulations. And the sad news, a lot of these regulations are coming from Washington. In fact, there's a regulation that's being debated in the Supreme Court right now as we speak, and it will be the biggest news story in the United States in the next two weeks when the Supreme Court rules on Obamacare. The sad news is during this national health care crisis and the largest legislation that our nation has ever seen, our governor and her administration sat on the sidelines and refused to challenge the national health care system and refused to communicate with the people of North Carolina on what the alternatives might be and also what the impact on our Medicaid and Medicare and small businesses would be. And there's tremendous impact on it right now. I know businesses, small businesses in North Carolina that have told me they are growing, they want to grow, but they refuse to go over 70 employees because then they'd have to be pulled into the Obamacare system. And yet our governor and our state stands on the sidelines and let others fight our battle. That is not the leadership we deserve with regard to regulations. And there are a lot of state and local regulations that overlap each other and are literally making small businesses, some with only 70 to 100 people, have three or four people on their staffs just to deal with regulations. We need a serious effort coming out of state government to go, what are the regulations that make sense? What are the regulations that we have on our books that are just creating work for government? And which ones are going to have long-term impact on the future of North Carolina's economy? We need some serious questions in this area. We cannot live off of our past brand. As in any business, we constantly need to change our brand and see what the competition is doing. The third thing I want to briefly talk about is this, and that's education. I have a passion for education. I got my teaching degree from Catawba College way back in the 70s. I even passed the, the teacher's exam here in North Carolina. My parents were pretty proud of that at the time. I never got to become a teacher in the public school system, but I actually got a job with Duke Energy, and for seven of my 28 years, I was director of training and education for the seventh largest utility company in the nation. 15 to 20 years ago, we were doing long distance training. We were doing training through computers and self-learning with adult learning. We knew we had to adapt our curriculum every year to meet the customer needs. The dilemma we're having right now in education is we're again living on the past brand of our universities, of our K through 12, and of our community colleges. All brands which have been good, but the fact of the matter is they're falling behind. Our dropout rate in our North Carolina high schools is over 20%. You know what happens to a kid that drops out of high school. He's going to be a burden on his family, a burden on society, and they're not going to be productive. 
And that's just inexcusable. And therefore, to ask you for me to raise your taxes, to pour more money into the system, is wrong because we need to first find out what are we doing wrong, and we need to correct it. And if it needs more revenue, then we'll seek more revenue. But why don't we first find out what we're doing wrong and fix what we're doing wrong? <laughs> Same thing with our university system. Our university system, the costs are going up 7 to 8 percent a year where the rate of inflation is 2 to 3 percent at most. And yet for the past decade, the costs keep going up and up and up. And yet feedback from employers that I get throughout the state are, is this, is that when we get many of the graduates, they're not qualified and they don't have the skills needed to meet our needs. We have remedial training in reading and writing and math in K through 12, in our community colleges, and our university system. You know, one thing I learned in business, you fix the problem at the front end so you don't have to repeat and spend more money at the back end. And yet we're spending all this money all the way through the process, K through 18, and putting people through a remedial reading and math and other courses. You fix it at the beginning as opposed to pour all the money in at the end. And in the long run, then we all save money and we have a better education system. There's one thing else I'm passionate about with regard to education. And I apologize if I offend any of the room because this may be politically incorrect. But it's time that we have straight talk with people in North Carolina. And that is this. I think there are two pathways to success for someone graduating from high school. The first pathway is to get, take a four-year college curriculum course so you can get one of our great universities or small colleges throughout North Carolina. We have a lot of choices. And that's a, that's a pathway that I took when graduating from Ragsdale High School in 1974. But I think there's another pathway to sex, success, and that is the trade and vocational route. One of the biggest pieces of feedback I get are two things. One is employers are saying we cannot find the mechanics and electricians and people can fix things and repair things and innovate things because the 50 and 60 year olds are retiring and we can't find the 20 and 30 year olds to fill those jobs even with an unemployment rate of 9.4 percent. We can't find them here in North Carolina. And yet there are people with that type of talent which I respect because it's talent I don't have. My wife reminds me of that all the time. <laughs> but it's a talent I respect. So therefore, I think we're forcing a lot of kids who have this talent into a curriculum and into kind of an elitist mentality that the only pathway to success is to go get a four-year college degree. I hear this from the president. I've heard this from our governor. I disagree. I think there are two pathways to success. And both of them are important to our future economy here in North Carolina. We've got to respect both pathways. And we will all benefit, and I think we'll reduce the dropout rate in North Carolina. If we don't put all this pressure in making someone, you know, I wonder if at Ragsdale High School, someone would have made me take auto mechanic courses in order to graduate. I would have had a tough time. My dad was an engineer, and he always said, are you sure you're my son? You cannot fix it. Fix mechanically. I, I don't have that mechanical aptitude. I respect that aptitude. It's desperately needed. And I want to help those people get those skills and get them jobs and get them into our two-year, what we used to call tech schools, to get it done, to meet industry needs. This is the way we need to think out of the box with regards to education. We cannot live off of our past brand, whether it's in our K through 12, our community colleges, or our universities. We're going to have to constantly change. Part of the reason is because there is no new money out there, and the other reason is our competition is changing. And I'm not going to lose to our competition. 